Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin this study with a word of prayer. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful uh, for the opportunities that you give us each day to come to know you. And um, for your Holy Spirit that speaks to our heart and that brings conviction. And for the way that you help us endure the trials in this world of sin and suffering. We just ask, Lord, for your strength, for your wisdom and understanding, and for your peace that passeth understanding. We need you every moment of this day, and we need you in this study. As we uh, begin to sort through uh, the stories of the past in Scripture and how they relate to us at the present time, and to show us our present duty. So we just ask that you can continue to guide and lead that your Holy Spirit can be here to speak to each person. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, at the end of the study yesterday, we, we were addressing uh, what particular points, does anybody remember? Because uh, we had reviewed basically what we had come to understand. If people can, somebody can, somebody sum up what we came to understand about uh, Judges chapter fourteen in regards to the riddle. What we had sorted out so far. Well, we were looking at it. Can I know Millerite history? Okay. Uh, so, so the connection to Millerite history was? You have the angel coming down. He rolls like a lion. And then they have that experience where they have sweetness in your mouth mm -hmm. coming. Right. So that's going to... Yeah, connect this connection to, the, there. Yeah, to Revelation 10, right? So yeah, I okay. think that's the main connection that we have here. So I still think there is a few things that we need to um, kind of refine as far as that. So just to, to go to Revelation 10, we know that this is uh, Millerite history. The seven thunders. And we have this, this book that's been sealed with seven seals. And we know that that is in Revelation chapter five, that the line of the tribe of Judah is going to unseal this book. Of course, he's seen as a lamb that's slain with seven horns and seven eyes. And but here in Revelation 10, we see Christ with this little book in his hand, and it's open. Right? And then there are symbols here that tie us back to Daniel chapter 12. We've studied this chapter many times. But it's verse 3, and he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, these seven thunders, do these relate to the riddle? Is that what needs to be unraveled in the story of Samson? Well, you have seven days being mentioned in that connection with other. Yeah, the seven days, right, in order to understand the riddle. And we have here the seven thunders. So we have the symbol of the seven. We have the symbol of the lion that roars. Right, so... When he's going down to Timnath there, this young lion comes and roars uh, as he approaches, right? 
So I, I don't think that we could dismiss these symbols here. The number seven, the lion roaring. And, and of course, this is going to end with this little book uh, eating the little book, which is going to be in the mouth sweet as honey. So the lion with the, the honey in it um, definitely must relate to Revelation chapter 10. So if we take... Um, If we take Revelation chapter 10, then, and we try to understand that in the context of how we understand this chapter in Judges chapter 14. We, we know that the bees also represent FFA. So we can take, we can take Millerite history and we can lay it down over top of our history. Right, which we've already done. We already understand this. But this becomes a lot, comes a lot closer to us. Uh, one of the things is during the seven day feast, there is this 30, 30, 30 that's mentioned. So we have um, these 30 uh, men, right, that. Uh, with these 30 companions. So there's 30 companions brought to be with Samson. Now, so these aren't really Samson's friends, are they? They're just sort of, I mean, I'm just trying to understand this. These were uh, provided by this Philistine woman, right? Or by somebody. Or is it, you know, having to do with Samson's father who brings brings this? Is this? Uh, I don't know if the story is clear on this point, but we do have these thirty companions mentions thirty shirts and thirty changes of garments, and we we understood that that thirty 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 if divided by twelve gives you um, 25,252.5, which gives us symbols that we can attach to the 777 structure. So we have that. And then it's going to be in 14, verse 14, that, that he's going to put forth this riddle. Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. So we have three days as a symbol here. Now, we have the seven days of the feast, but we have the three days. And how do we apply the three days in our time? You can maybe apply it to July, when July 18 symbolize. The 21st of July, the midnight cry or midnight. Okay, so so there's a few different ways that we've applied the three days. So sometimes we apply it to uh, the th three Sabbaths that are the main uh, pillars of that 777 structure, right? Ending on the 20th day of the ninth month, so we can. Uh, place that there with uh, the story of Ezra. But we also know that the three days can represent the three days from July 18th to July 21st in Millerite history. Is that, is that, that's what you're saying, Stephen? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, so this symbol relates to the prediction before midnight, which, which is what the label that we gave that July 18th to, to midnight. Um, what we can say here is that there is a period of time in which this feast occurs 
And it's, but the, in three days, they could not expound the riddle. So, and it says it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Have ye called us to take that we have? Is it not so? Right? So they're going to make an accusation against this woman. But the main thing here is that we have on the seventh day they do this, but it talks about they could not in three days expound the riddle. So there's the seven days in Judges 14 is also related to Revelation 8, uh, verse 1, the half hour or 7.5 days. So this is the question, you know, is it? Um, I, I, I don't think so. And then Iran asked, does it mean that the companions were called by the wife? And that's what I'm not sure about, who calls the companion. And I don't know if it's a really important point, but it might be. Uh, to understand who these companions are, that is, if the wife was calling them, that would be the church calling these companions. Because it doesn't really give us who that they saw him and they brought 30 companions to be with him. It doesn't really give us um, who that would be. Because we know his father went down unto the woman and Samson there made, made there a feast or so he used the young men to do and it came to pass when they saw him. So who is they that saw him? That's what we don't know. Any thoughts on this? Would that be his friends? His friends saw yeah. him? Yeah, I don't know. Because they're going to bring 30 companions to be with him. So his friends are going to bring 30 companions? Well, I mean... I think it could be, sorry, it could be the young man. Verse 10? Yeah, but, it says, but that's just talking in general. For so you, the young men use... Uh, used the young men to do so it's just saying young men used to do this they'd have these feasts however that was um so i don't think it's referring to the young men but that's not really a specific group that's being mentioned that's just uh you know less right, than right. yes do you my thinking is it's maybe applying to like they just the people of the village of Pemna. Yeah, I mean, that's the way that I would originally read it. But, you know, I, I would like to know who who this is specifically because it would it would tell us something. So these 30 companions, um, you know, who would they symbolize or what would they symbolize in, in our line? And, you know, where did they come from? So, I mean, these are people that are called, I guess, is or brought here. So they're brought to Samson, to this message. And they need to understand this riddle. Right? So Samson represents Christ. So this is, is Christ that is, is giving this riddle. And we're given the seven days of the feast to understand this riddle. And if we can understand it, we get a change of garment. So 
So, so do these companions represent those in this movement? But they're not going to be able to unravel this riddle. They're going to need, uh, basically, in this story, this the moral aspect of it is, of course, the, the wife is going to uh, just nag Samson, right? And then he's finally going to tell her the riddle. So um, I just did a, a definition from the old Webster's and it said one who keeps company with another, one with whom a person frequently associates and converses. It differs from friend, says Johnson, as acquaintance from confidence. The word does not necessarily imply friendship, but a companion is often or generally a friend. And then it's got a few more definitions, but that was the one that that stuck out to me. Yeah. Well, in Hebrew, though, it's just a friend. I mean, is that so, what it is in Hebrew? Yeah. It's in the sense of companionship, a friend, which and I don't know if I'd make that distinction nowadays with the word companion, but definitely in 1828, it would have been a bit of a distinction there. But the idea is a companion or a friend um in Hebrew and it, it says even a confidential friend so that would be more than just somebody that goes along with you so now what about the number 30 itself I mean in the context of this relationship I mean, we know it represents the period of a month. But these are, are con we'll say they're confidential friends that, that are being brought to Samson. They would be people brought into his confidence. And Samson's going to propose a riddle to them. And in order to, you know, to receive these changes of garments, they need to declare the riddle right um that is uh, the word there to declare nagad means properly to front that is to stand boldly out opposite uh, by implication to manifest figuratively to announce uh, specifically um, to expose predict explain so Well, the, whether the they is the innumerable multitude of Revelation 7, 9, I'm not sure how you're thinking that, because uh, that's going to be much later. This is referring to our time. So I don't think there's an innumerable multitude at this time. So, I mean, the day is just unspecified. But here, if we're looking at this, would these 30 companions represent this entire movement? Would it represent something else? Would it represent those that are, are studying the chronology or something like that? Because they are going to receive a change of raiment. And they are going to uh, declare the riddle except that, you know, it's going to be because of, in this story, their relationships, at least from Samson's accusation, their relationships with his wife. So wouldn't that demand um, that we use it in that manner? I mean, uh, if, if those folks are going to declare the riddle, if those folks are going to make it through, then... Um, wouldn't that almost demands that it would have to be some, you know, uh, the movement 
those yeah, that do. But some, but some part of the movement, the ones that 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 are the confidential friends, right? That, that do declare the riddle, right? Okay. Now, of course, in the story, they have an illicit relationship with the woman, but here we we have to flip things around morally. So this this would be um, something else, right? Because th this whole thing, it, being morally ironic, it's sometimes hard to do, at least for me. Um, to make the jump? Yeah, to <laughs> flipping it around. Without changing the story. That is, the story is not a mirror. Uh, it's just morally it is. Morally it's ironic. So, so we have these 30. Now, of course, we have the 30, 30, 30, which we connect to the 777. Seven, seven, but just the 30 itself... I mean, relates to the number three. Um, so it's those pe people that are, if we're going to compare this to the story of, of Ezra, right? So in the story of Ezra, there's going to be three months for the divorce, right? Correct. So we have those three days that precede the 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 20th day of the ninth month, December 25th, 2021. And then you have um, 10 days, right? So you're going to have 10 days to the first day of the first month. And those 10 days are, you know, to the first day of the first month from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month is three months, symbolically 90 days, literally 88 days, and, you know, and as again, as I pointed out last time, we, we have the 2,640 days from the end of Colin's prediction, um, which is uh, the, the end of January 11th, the beginning of January 12th. So that's going to be my son James is going to turn 32 on January 12th. Ryan, who many people know in this movement, he's going to be 33 on January 12th. So. Um, but from there, it's going to be 2,640 days. That is 88 uh, times 30. So if we took it as instead of 88 days, 88 months, and it goes to April 5th, 2030. But also, if we count from uh, the first day of the 10th month, so that was... Um, the first day of the 10th month was uh, here. So just to make sure I got that correct again. That was three days ago. And that was the 25th. And that's where we began this new study on the simple presentation of the lines. The lines simply presented. Right, which is now... 90 times uh, 29.530587 days. So if you count uh, actual lunar months, you count 90 of them. It also brings us to April 5th, 2030. So can we say that this is the beginning of the divorce proceedings that are being symbolized here from the story of Ezra? with the 30 and the three days. Does that seem reasonable? Okay, so so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to this line here. And hopefully I did that right. Yeah. <clears throat> so now we're going to put some dates at the end of this structure. And I'm going to do it this way. So... So here we need to put December 
um, 25th, 2021. Okay, so Ron says he found something is interesting regarding Samson. And that's going to be, um, well, I can click on the link there. Can you tell us what you, you saw there? Yeah, um, it was, let me look at it. Make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's what caught my eye. Um, when I did this search on Samson and he was in there down a ways and she talked, he, uh, he, she was talking about Manoah, uh, uh, the wife getting instruction. But as I was going through it, I spotted that preparing the people. I just thought it was, uh, a, a little interesting that that's what we're doing. We're, we're studying for that. Uh, I haven't read this whole thing. I've just, it just, I just spotted it as I was going. So but it's mostly going to be here talking about John the Baptist. Yeah, that's what I noticed. But what it's going to do is it's going to refer us to uh, the Nazarite vow. Yes. As this. I... And it's a typo in there. Uh, this instruction was repeated to the month. So I'm just going to read this here. Um, now this is. Uh, November 3rd, 1901, and manuscript 112. So I'm actually going to go to the manuscript. Look at that. So in manuscript 112, so here it is. Um, <clears throat> some portions of this manuscript are published in five Bible commentary, but we have it here. Um, I thought it was interesting. There was only like 10, not very many, um, not very many hits on the word Samson in her writings. Yeah. And I don't know how you got here because Samson is spelt wrong. Um, this has a P in it. I don't know if you noticed this here. So. No, I didn't notice it. Yes, I did. I put the P in there. I do recall. So you typed looking for the word Samson with a P? Yes. Well, that's why you didn't find many hits. I'm, I'm not sure how they get Samson with a P. I'm not sure either, but it hit with it hit on that. Okay, so that's a, a misspelling, but um, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so in the time of Moses, the Nazarites were instructed not to use wine or strong drink. Uh, because this is talking about John was consecrated to God as a Nazarite. So John the Baptist it has this Nazarite vow. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from the wine from wine and strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat any eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. This instruction was repeated to the mother of Samson. An angel came to the wife of Manoah, saying, Behold, thou shalt bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from his birth to the day of his death. For the sake of her unborn child, lest her appetite should be transferred to him, the mother was restricted in her diet. Um, so the, the work of John is clearly mapped out. So can we say that this movement 
in, in symbol is taking a Nazarite vow. And that this whole issue of, you know, the strange wives and all of these things illust is illustrated in the story of Samson in that this movement is like Samson in character. So even though it's a, you know, it's a morally ironic story, it does represent our nature, our character, our true condition. But the purpose is to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, right? That's what this movement is about. And That's yet, what I thought. And, and, and the, but the problem is, of course, we're not, we're like Samson. We've made this vow, but we don't reflect uh, our purpose, So I'm just gonna gonna just move some of this here. Take this. Now uh, we have this eleven nine and nine eleven, but I'm just gonna kind of split them up here. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go nine eleven. All right, and this is gonna be eleven nine. So I'm gonna do them like this, just for a reason. Okay, and and here we're going to have this July 18th as the center of this structure. Now, does anybody know how many days from uh, September 11th to July 18th? I guess like, uh, six, six thousand. What? 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 Stephen? Is it six thousand eight hundred and eighty-five? Yeah, so six thousand eight hundred and eighty-five, and uh, one of the significance. Uh, aspect of that number, uh, 6,885 days, is that it's 153 times 45. Now, why do I bring this here at this time? Just So okay, so 153, uh, it's it's a reverse of 135, or the numbers are 135, and also 351, and it's also connected to John 2111, and 150 and three fish in the net that Peter pulled in without net breaking. And the, 100, so the 153 days of Samuel Snow's letters. I forgot that part. I didn't see it. And it's also a shorthand for the 1533, right? The wonderful manifestation of the power of God from August 11th, 1840 to uh, October 22, 1844, right? And of course, 45 being um, a symbol of this history in the time of Trump, right? Right. Okay. So, so we have this this symbol here, and and so I'm just I'm just putting it in there just so that people know about it. It's not I'm not particularly sure exactly um, how we we could relate it to this story, but I think it's an important part of this story. So we're going to take the line roaring. I'm putting it here at nine eleven and eleven nine. That is, those are really the same history. But one is just a bit zo more zoomed in to our line, to the 777 structure. Now, we have then December 25th, 2021. So this is the 20th day of the ninth month, as we know. 
And can we make this um, Judges 14, 14? Now, you know, I would normally want to put Judges 14, 14 at the center, right, on July 18th. But could we say that Judges 13, 13, the center of that is July 18th, but Judges 14, 14 is really um, when the riddle is put forward, in a sense, because Colin's going to present a riddle there. Even though this whole line is a riddle, yeah, yeah, that makes kind of sense. That makes sense. Okay. Now we know that that riddle is going to have an end period, right? So this riddle, that January eleventh or something, wasn't it? Yeah. So this is going to bring us to uh, January eleventh. Um, 2023. So just put Jan. Okay. Now, but we also have another date, and that date would be December 25th, 2022 because that's going to be um, the first day of the 10th month. So both of these dates symbolize the first day of the 10th month. Does that make sense? Um, can you go back over that one again, please? Okay. So Colin makes a, pr proposes this riddle on December 21st, 2021. And December, or December, December 25th, 2021, right? The 20th day of the ninth month. And then we're gonna have December 25th, 2022, which is the first day of the 10th month. First day of the 10th month is when the divorce proceedings begin. So remember on the 20th day of the ninth month, that's when they gather after this period of three days, right? Right. They start the, these divorce proceedings on the first day of the 10th month. So you can see why these two go together, right? They're both December 25th. But Colin's prediction ends on January 11th. Now from January 11th, we're going to have, so I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to take these two dates, copy them, paste them here. What happens? Okay. And I'm just going to do it like this so that we understand these two dates a little bit better. So January 11th is... Um, 30 times 88, which equals 2640, which goes to April 5th, 2030. Okay, does that make sense? Much better. Okay, and then we take December 25th. This is going to be 29 point, we'll just do 0.53 times 90, or even better, 30 plus 30 plus 30. Right? Which goes uh, which is a period of, which equals uh, 2,657 days, which goes to, again, April 5th, 
23rd. Okay. So that's the other date we have to put in here. Okay, is this making sense to people? Now, of course, we can tie this then to Millerite history because we know from the first day of the first month in 1844, it's 2300 months, lunar months to April 5th, 2030. It's also 187 prophetic years plus 20 prophetic months, April 5th, 2030. So, so we have all this evidence, but can we see that, that this is what the riddle is about? Is that, and I'm just gonna make a little bit bigger for people who have smaller screens, so whoops, so they can see this. Okay, is that anybody got comments on this? Anybody with, which I think it's one, six, five, eight days. It's like 7.75 or something like that. So, oops. If I counted from the end of the day, December 25th, it would go to April 5th to the start. So it depends how you want to count it, because it's a decimal of point 26, 2657.75 days or something like that. Quarter days there. Is this making sense to people or am I just. Um... is we're connecting this riddle to what Colin had proposed. And that's, that's part of this riddle that's been given to us. It's, it's, I, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to go over all these, these dates and stuff and yeah, um, yeah so it's, it's, it's it makes sensible to it. You know, if there's some sense to it. Yeah. And it comes from the line and the honey, right? So that's that's our message. And we can definitely see that Colin's riddle relates to what had gone before, right? So I still think that we need to understand Colin's riddle better. You know, what, what he was proposing. Now, we know it's all tied together to July 18th, because Colin is, is tying it there. He's not rejecting July 18th. And Odilio also, what he presents, which is part of that puzzle, um, now, is there any way that we could differentiate um, Colin's presentation and Odilio's and then relate them to, to this story specifically? Because we do have um Collins uh, study on December 25th. We also have uh, Odilio's, I believe is February 12th, 2022 in there, you know, and uh, I know there's some things that we do with that. I can't remember what they were. Yeah, we'll probably have to review that stuff. Yeah. So we can do what you propose. Yeah, but yeah, I'm just, yeah, we're going to have to do that because Odilio's part of the presentation is is important because one is his presentation ties these things together much more solidly. I mean, his whole idea of and it wasn't just his presentation dealing with the mandates, but it was also his presentation dealing with. Um, uh, the numbering of the tribe of 
Which tribe was it? Zebulun. Zebulun, yeah. So it was the tribe of Zebulun, uh, counting back from July 18, 2020, all the way to uh, the organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, right? And then we, we found a whole bunch of things dealing with that. So this was quite a while ago. Um, so are people satisfied with this? Do people have questions about what we did here? Can you reduce this a little bit so I can put us take a screenshot of it? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. So I, I I just think that this is pretty profound from my perspective. I mean, we have two different ways in which we're dealing with that 30, 30, 30, right? It produces the 777. It also gives us the number of days from this, the presentation that just happened on December 25th. And, and things didn't really unfold the way that I had intended. So coming up to this last weekend, um, you know, I was planning maybe some extra programs on December 25th. 24th, um, but we just weren't impressed in that way. Instead, we joined them in their study. But on the anniversary of Colin's prediction, uh, we had this um, occur. Now, when it comes to uh, trying to remember what that was, I'm just going to. Um, and, and just dealing with Colin's prediction too, when we get to that December 20, um, let me see. So that was on Saturday. So on the 24th, there was 781 days from November 3rd, 2020. And the, that was the election. And November 3rd, 2020 was the 17th day of the eighth month, or the eighth month, 17th day, which backwards, eight month, 17th day, if you read backwards, it's 718, which is, of course, these are symbols of July 18. Um, so even what happened on Sabbath was connected. But I think it's much more si significant to understand this December 25th date as far as the understanding of the riddle. So we have this riddle that needs to be understood. And it's understood in connection with this divor these divorce proceedings, right? So we know that the first day of the first month is when the divorce ends. Is it going to take us that long? I mean, if we're going to take this as literal time, is it going to take us that long to get to where we need to be? Okay, the question is, is there any connection between January 11, 2020 and January 11, 2023? And I would say, yes, that there is. So January 11, 2020 was the end of this Levitical chiasm. It wasn't really the complete end of it because from January 11, 2020, we marked 441 days to March 27th, 2021 which is 63 weeks. So that's what uh, Daniel there is referring to um, in the chat. Now, so that connection is a period of three years, which, which also can be represented by three days. So it just is another three that ties us to January 11th. Does that make sense? Are you happy with that, Daniel? 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I've noted that before, uh, but it's really important right here in the context of what we're studying of all these different connections. So January 11th, 23, 23 doesn't come out of nowhere. Right? It's, it's a date that three years earlier was noted by Jeff and represented a message to the Levites. Now, the question about this time, because in no way am I suggesting that April 5th, 2030 is, has to be a literal date in which some event occurs, right? We can see at the, at the very least, it is a symbolic date. And that may be all that it is, right? It may just be giving us light as far as our feet presently. Because I don't think that we can predict events. Now, maybe as time goes on, maybe time will go on. Maybe there will be something that we would see after the fact that relates to this movement. Um, you know, there are people who would want to say, well, maybe that's when Nashville is going to be, you know, hit by a fireball or whatever. You know, people are going to predict all kinds of things. But I don't think that that's our responsibility. Um, I don't think that that's what we should be doing. So I wouldn't do that. Um, I think you're correct in that, Theodore. Yeah. But I just wanted to mention it because I know that that's gone through people's minds. Um, but symbolically, we have this period of time, which is these divorce proceedings. And these divorce proceedings are not about separating people. They're about separating out truth from error, the precious from the vile sorting out how we are to, to study God's word. And, and that's within this movement. It would also represent the work that's going on in separating sin from us as individuals. Um, and it would symbolize the work that, um, that occurred in the upper room. So the upper room would symbolize this work that's going on now. And so this is not an easy task that's, that's put before us, right? Because as human nature would like to justify its own actions, um, we are clearly being shown that we can't do that. Any other thoughts on this, these points here, what we have drawn? Are people satisfied with this at this point? I'm still looking at it, Theodore, but, you know, uh, it's got a lot of stuff on here. Mm -hmm. And trying to make all the connections, you know, it's <laughs> it's a work. I got to go all the way back to my notes all the time, you know, okay. so I can track this thing. Okay. But, but we are satisfied with it at this point, like even if there's things that it's not complete. No, it doesn't seem to be complete, complete, but it's, it's got a lot of stuff on there and it's telling us something. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so that's what we needed to finish up with Judges 14, as far as I can see. I don't see that we could, you know, continue looking at, I mean, we're going to come back to it, but at this point, I think we would have to just say, we've studied Judges 14, we've dealt with all the symbols, we could put it on a line, um, and then we would look at Judges 15. So Judges 13 zoomed into July 18. That's what it looks like. Judges 14 really zoomed into the December 25th date. Yeah. Okay. So now we're in Judges 15. Yeah. So um, it came to pass within a while after, well, a while after, in the time of wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid. And he said, I will go into my wife, into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. So, so his wife ended up marrying someone else, right? Um, right. And her father said, 
I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. And Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure? And, and this becomes this really interesting part of this story. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between the two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. Now, the way that we had applied this before is we could see, of course, the connection with the story of Gideon and the 300. Uh, but these foxes are tied tail to tail. So this is a mirror, right? With the firebrand in the midst of the two tails. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that works. Now, it reminds us a little bit of Genesis chapter 15 with the carcasses and the, the, smoking lamp and the burning the burning lamp and the smoking furnace that pass between the carcasses now as far as these two tails uh you know we had made application here to uh, the messages of colin and odilio correct do people remember that yes somewhat okay so, I mean, there's obviously 300 foxes, but these, these tails are, and, and how this happens, I mean, it, it, I can't really picture it exactly what's, what's being, what's occurring here. But, you know, he sets these brands on fire, lets them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burnt both the shocks and all the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. So this is destroying the grain, the wine, the spirit, right? So this is the study and the understanding, Philistine understanding of truth is going to be destroyed by these 300 foxes. So does this fit in with our story that we, we have, our application that we've made so far? And there's, there's lots of things here, like even the offering of the younger sister. What would that be? How would we apply that to our history? What does the father represent here? So he's a Philistine, right? Yeah, yeah, he's a Philistine. The father's a Philistine. Yeah. The, the younger daughter um, can be representative of uh, a church body. Yes? No? Yeah. But maybe an offering of their own ministry, per se. Yeah. What, uh, what this, is, this is to Samson. It's its own. And Samson is this message, right? Yeah. Would it be also the younger sister represent the Omega? Could possibly, yeah. Right. That's yeah, the way. Actually, that, that, that does sound fairly logical. Because we can see the connection between the Omega and this marriage with the Philistines, right? With this false teaching and understanding. And that, that is, has been offered to this movement. Mm. Right? Right. So, I mean, this would go back, if we're going to take the story of Samson here, we're, we're going to, we're going to take it back to November 9th, right? 
Right. So, so it's at November 9th that we have this offering of the younger sister, right, in connection with that history. Yeah, that, that's, that's entirely um, acceptable. Okay. So people see what we're doing here, how we're looking at this story? I'm starting to really get it. I mean, the more and more we talk about this, it's, it's, it's becoming clearer and clearer, yes. Now, and it's also after the time of wheat harvest. Now, what does the wheat harvest symbolize? I mean, what is, so it's after the time of the wheat harvest. What's the wheat harvest? Well, if, if we're, if this is the Philistine wheat harvest, could this be? Um... It'd be the same as, but, you know, the same period of time. But when we talk about the wheat harvest, we're talking about the seven weeks. Uh, right? Yes. Okay. So that's that Pentecost. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, uh, seven weeks, 49, uh, and one more would be Pentecost, right? Yeah. Now, there's different ways that we could place this because, I mean, we're saying that this is dealing with 9-11 um, as far as the offering of the younger wife. But... Um, when we look at, um, so I'm just going to do this here. You can't see what I'm doing. But how many days is it from Colin's presentation to Odilia's? If you're going to guess. From December 25th, 2021 20, to February 12th, 2022. How many days? 39. 49 days, right? So can we see that that period of wheat harvest, the period of this... The, there's your seven weeks. There's your seven weeks, right? Okay. So it's connecting these, these two predictions. So, so we already had said before, before we understood the number of days and, and the wheat harvest connection. Um, and, and wheat harvest is just a shorthand for that period of, of time that we have is the, the, the Feast of Weeks, right? So the Feast of Weeks begins with the, the wave sheaf offering uh, at first fruits, right? And then you have this harvest period. So it's connected with that. Um, so, but we know that this offering, at least the way that I look at it, unless we're gonna look at this offering being offered again, um, that the younger sister being offered again has to do with um, that message again at this time. Though I don't see it happening. I don't see Parminder's message having any um, influence on the movement, but maybe maybe other places in the world it is. Uh, I know in um, Romania and I know in places in Africa, but there still is an influence that Parminder's message has. Um, if anybody knows about that, uh, maybe that was something that as FFA ended, as our 777 structure ended, you know, at the end of this structure, that we have this offered again, but I don't know. So, you know, that would just be speculation. But I definitely can see that the younger sister would refer back to the Omega. Because it is a younger sister. And it is fairer in the sense of it's much more attractive to human nature. I mean, this is the woke movement that is really appealing to human nature on, on a very... Um, human nature level, if <laughs> We want to put it that way. It's not presenting a cross at all. <clears throat> okay. So then we also know that um, the Philistines get upset because of this and that they're going to end up 
burning her, her and her father with fire. Now, the one thing about this story is it has this fire aspect in it, which is, you know, something we would connect to Nashville. And so, you know, a person could, and again, we're just talking about where people would try to take this April 5th, 2030 date and say, well, that's going to be about Nashville. But we would have to look at this symbolically in the context of Pentecost. Does this also then refer to the Holy Spirit? Because remember, this is a morally ironic story. And so it's, I mean, even though we can have this, this woman that's going to be, you know, that's Samson's wife that ends up marrying someone else, however we under, understand that, and her father are going to be burnt with fire which was her whole concern about it in the first place with Samson. And that's why she revealed the riddle, why she got the riddle out of Samson and told it to these others because of the threat that had come against her and her family. Right. So again, it's hard to flip this around morally, but can we see that Pentecost is connected with fire? Or, or am I going off course here? Because doesn't Pentecost end up correcting the disciples after their time in the upper room? Well, what, wasn't it wasn't it fiery tongues that came down on them at that time? Right. So they're going to go through this period of reconciliation with one another and with Christ. They come to the upper room, and at the end of the upper room, that's the end of the harvest, right? That they're going to have the Holy Spirit poured out. So here they're going to be burnt up, but here they must represent in some way the movement um, receiving the Holy Spirit. That's the way that I would understand it, flipping it around morally. And so that would tie us into uh, this, this line, again, with these two messages leading, because these are supposed to lead to the upper room, right? And, and at the end of the upper room, we get the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the end of wheat harvest. Okay, so this, this is the first part of this story in chapter 15. And I think it fits in perfectly with what we already understand. Then we have in 15 verse 8, um, and then, uh, and, and he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt on the top of the rock, eat him, Right? So we had discussed this before. This means a hawk. And then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. Um, Lehi means jaw, right? So this is where, uh, and he says, the men of Judah said, why are you come up against us? And they answered to bind Samson, are we come up to do to him as he hath done to us? And then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock, Etam, and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, As they did unto me, so I have done unto them. And they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, Swear unto me that 
ye will not fall upon me yourselves. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we are we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into the, their hand. But surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistine shouted against him. The spirit of the Lord came. Um, and when he came unto Lehi, the Philistine shouted against him. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire and his bands loosed from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps. So we have this doubling here, right? Hamara, Hamara. With the jaw of an ass have I slain a thousand men. Okay, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramath Lehi, which means the height of the jawbone, because Ramath just means height. So in this story, uh, what do we see in connection with our lines? So we see the symbol of, of an ass, right, Islam. We have this doubling. We also have these two new chords, another doubling. Um, we have this rock Etam, which uh, to understand what that is, um, this lofty hawk, right? That's what the word rock means, lofty. Um, and we have 3,000 men of Judah. So we have... Judah being mentioned here. Uh, we also have this oath that's made, which is Sheba, right? The seven times. Swear unto me that you will not fall upon me yourselves. Um, what other symbols do we have here? They're not going to kill him. They are going to bind him with those two new cords. Brought him up from the rock, eat them, eat them. Okay. Yeah. So what are these symbolizing? Regarding the rock, isn't that, it says the top of the rock, doesn't that mean the cleft? Hiding well, in the cleft of rock. Well, the, the, cliff is, in yeah, the cliff would be when a rock is 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 split. Like that would be a broken yeah. rock. So I don't know if I would make that application here. What what would that symbol mean then if you did that? Well, you're hiding, you're hiding yourself from the face of God. Basically, you you cannot spend to see God's glory, so you're protected by hiding in the cleft. But you're so eager to behold the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. mm. So I'm sorry. So how did you see that the cleft? Um, yeah, I don't know what she's, yeah. can you explain it? Cause I don't understand it. I mean, that's, you know, Moses hides in the cliff of the rock, you know, to see the glory of God, but I don't see this as a cliff of a rock, but What was the definition of Etam again? Hawk. Hawk. Mm -hmm. 
H A W K. Yeah. You have uh, symbols of finding and missing. We understand that uh, that's connected to Islam in Revelation chapter 9. Okay. Right. So, I mean, one of the things we do believe is that Islam is going to be loosened again. Right. I mean, it's quite clear. Now, again, I wouldn't I attack so. to, to April 5th, 2030 and say, you know, on that date, you know, Nashville is going to be attacked or anything like that. But in this history that we are approaching, Islam is going to become an issue again. I, I think that's pretty clearly understood. And this would show us that, that our message is going to contain a message regarding Islam. And with the jaw, you have a symbol of the knife being a message. Yeah. Yeah, because of... What, what's the reasoning there? I'm just saying a jaw born of an ass to have like a mouth connected with Islam. Yeah. So it's like a message of Islam. Yeah. Is there is there anything coincidental about the jawbone and um, the speaking ass of Balaam? Yes. Yeah, that's that's what we connect that to. Okay, fine. Yeah, that, that deals with Islam. So, so we made that connection before. Yeah, but was the, did we make that connection, the jawbone with speaking? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. All right, so that's a message then. Yep. If that's what you're saying, because it's the jawbone at the jaw of the ass speaketh, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm getting it. Okay. Now, um, now the the when it comes to the three thousand of Judah. How did we deal with the 3,000? Because we, we can take a numbering of a tribe and refer to it as a period of days. So... We could put 3,000 days in there somewhere. I mean, I know we're, it's a bit of chronology stuff. Um, now, it is eight years, 0. 0.3333, so it's um, eight years and 120 days, prophetic years. In literal years, it's eight years and 78 days. <clears throat> well, since the uh, Judah became so sort of separated from the other tribes, yeah, it's uh, three thousand three thousand years takes you to twenty twenty four. Okay. Uh, that's that's just doing the simple math, or you? Yeah, it's just taking three thousand years, basically. Okay. From nine seventy-seven. Okay. 
so it would you would have to add a different another year in there, right? If you counted the actual number of years. No, that is the actual number of years. Well, that's the actual number of years. That's just uh, okay. Would it take us to twenty twenty three otherwise? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so that would be the three thousandth year. Yes. Okay. Where did you come up with the nine seventy seven again? That was just from where we're at now, or no? Nine seventy seven is the the dividing of the kingdom. Right, but how did he get? The three from that three thousand. How did it get to nine seventy seven? Well, three thousand years from nine seventy seven BC. Okay. If if we count the three thousandth year, that would be twenty twenty three. If we if we counted three thousand years uh, cardinally, we would get twenty twenty four. Right. So if we do whole years, we end up with. Sorry about blocking the screen there. Does that make sense? What he's doing? Yeah. So, that, so the 3000 does bring us to 2023. Um, so I guess another option would be to go. Uh, so if we went um, from, well, let me see here. What happens in 977? Um, Division of the kingdom of Israel. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, also, it's also the years between the fall of Western Rome in 476 and the fall of Eastern Rome in 1453. Yeah. And it's also the number of years from the first biblical prophecy of 120 years which was Genesis six three and the and the Exodus in fifteen thirty three. Yeah, so there's lots of symbols that nine seventy seven has. But yeah, it does bring us to twenty twenty three if we, if we want to make that connection. So that brings us to the end of uh, Colin's prediction as well. Hmm. Yeah, so there's got to be something more that um, we could see. Isn't 977 also the last year of which Solomon reigned? Yes. Yeah, because that's when the kingdom was divided. Yeah. Is there any significance in the fact that verse 11 points out the 3,000 men? Um, I don't know. I, I, the number just kind of jumped out at me. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I don't know if I would, that I can see anything really connected with this, I mean, obviously we have the 11, but the 15, you know, would be part of that verse. I mean, if you want to deal with it as something to do with 2023 as, you know, January 11th in there, but we have 
five in there too. So, I mean, to me, that would just be a little bit of, you know, looking for something, but. I'm just, I'm just going through possibilities. That's all. Yeah, I understand. And I'm just evaluating it, how my brain works. <clears throat> so. Um, yes, I know. That's why I asked. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, our time is pretty much up here. And so we're going to have to come back to this, but there's lots in this story of Samson. And we're also then going to have Samson and Delilah as well, you know, chapter 16. So this, this chapter 15, um, I mean, it's mostly relating to, um, Well, you know, this, if we're, if we're going to try to put it in, in, in our history, it's relating to this division, right? That, that exists within this movement. If we're going to take this, uh, the, the fact that Judah is now mentioned here. Because we haven't been dealing with Judah before in this story. And in judges, very little. If I can't think of uh, another time we had Judah connected here in judges. So, so the fact that Judah is going to deliver Samson into the hand of the Philistines, we, you know, we'd have to sort through that. And I can't remember how we dealt with that before. I'm going to have to look that up. Um. But what we can see so far is it does relate to the upper room experience, to Pentecost. You know, once we, we look at the inversion of these moral aspects, but then we have Judah introduced. And uh, that would bring us back to the division of the northern and the southern kingdom with 3,000 years. But I know we, we made some application in our history as well. And I just don't remember exactly what it was. Um, I, so know, I jumped through so the, I'm sorry, I did a search for Judah. The only place, the only other place is in Judges 10, 9 that it's mentioned. And 119, 18, 17. It was mentioned a bunch in first Judges. Um, but like you said, it hadn't been mentioned very much and the first place i pick up on it before 15 is on in uh 10 9. yeah and that had to do with uh uh ammon passed over jordan to fight against judah and against benjamin and against the house of ephraim at that point yeah Okay. It's also mentioned three times in Judges 15. So uh, verse 11, 10, and 9. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we are at. Okay, so I think we should end there. I was just looking at some other things, trying to figure those out. So let's uh, have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Your gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the time that we've had here this morning and for the light that you've shone upon our path. May we continue to walk in that light, um, that we not stumble and fall off the path, and help us to be faithful in all the things that you've given us to do today. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.